Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our session today. Uh, I think I want to spend just a minute or two kind of setting the stage for what we're going to be talking about. Um, this particular series uh, today and also Thursday, we're going to attempt to look at some real world examples of uh, uh, pricing uh, considerations and control, as well as looking deeper, probably outside of control. It's some overall uh, business profitability um, questions and issues and concerns and insights. Um, this particular session probably will make more sense if uh, if the attendees are involved in creating or uh, setting up control parts uh, or adjusting part multipliers, or if they have uh, you know some involvement on the financial side. We're going to follow parallel paths uh, as far as how I approach both the today's session and the one on Thursday. We're going to begin looking at a simple question. Would a pricing evaluation be helpful or would a process be helpful? Look at some common questions that might help uh, answer that question. And then what are some uh, meaningful things about an evaluation of pricing or financial analysis and then we'll look at some examples. Down at the bottom, you, you can see uh, my contact information. Uh, my phone number is there, 515-360-9882. And either my, my consultant email uh, that you see there on the screen, or you can also reach me um, uh, through my Sirius uh, uh, email that's also on the screen. And if you're interested in looking a little bit further independently, uh, my website is uh, is indicated there. I'm going to change um, and look at a. Uh, hang on a second. There we go. Specifically, I'm going to start off by making some introductory comments. Uh, then we'll look at some uh, more specifics about the pricing evaluation and also look at some highlights at the at the end. Now, this is kind of a touchy area. Um, a lot of the things that you're going to hear and see are represent things that I have found from my own experience. Um, doing a, an in-depth um, analysis of pricing or the financial side is uh, involves quite a bit of analytical uh, steps, and it can be quite time consuming. And it possibly would exceed some of the uh, um, skill set of, of people within the respective businesses. And if that's the case, then a pricing evaluation may be of, uh, of help on a consultative basis. And that is the essence of what uh, of what you're going to be seeing today, and similarly on on Thursday. Now I'm going to begin our discussion today by uh, just giving you a little bit of uh, let me flip over here um, to another. Uh... <clears throat> okay, I want to begin by just some general things um, that you might or might myself um, I've been in I'm, I'm an older guy I've been involved in various businesses 57 57 years started off in the software development side and design work I've started and operated several uh, two or three different businesses and in the last uh, 20 plus years have been involved uh, with the sign industry 17 little over 17 years of that has been uh, with uh, or with a relationship with Sirius uh, software. Over those years, I've trained hundreds of, uh, of clients uh, on the predecessor product to uh, of Sirius called SMS, as well as the current product uh, that we all know is Control. Um, and then I've, over the last two and a half or so years, um, I've created and I've hosted similar webinars to this and I think the number is now up in the in the 60 uh, range. Some of the things that I've discovered um, along the line is that 
it's it's not unusual that the relationship between part costs, multipliers, and gross margin is not as clear as it uh, as it might be. So the challenge then is how do you and in addition to that is how do you uh, determine what your hourly rate should be for equipment, and what should your labor rates be, and then finally. I see frequently that there's confusion on the whole notion of the relationship sales, cost of goods, operating expenses, and down to the bottom line, the net profit. And those are some of the things that we're going to dig pretty deeply into over the over today's session, and then following back up on the uh, uh, on Thursday with more of the financial side. Um, right now, I think as of most recent numbers that I've looked at, the, on the pricing evaluation side, I've done 21, uh, I've worked with 21 clients and 25 or 26 in different engagements. Some have are repeating. On the financial side, I've worked with 30 clients and uh, many of them have either done a second or even a third engagement. And then just general um, assistance to clients on more specific things, um, 10 different clients in, in 20 some things. So what I'm gonna do now is we're gonna switch over and look at a, a short uh, PowerPoint. Um, and we're gonna talk about some very, very basic things as we go through this. So I call this the pricing basics. In very, very simple terms, you have your price, and that's what you're going to charge the customer. You have some costs related to production, and that's the uh, uh, that's the seven hundred dollars. So the gross profit then is the difference between the two. So it's price minus cost equals gross profit. So you can see in this real simple illustration that gross profit is five hundred bucks. Now, control supports multiple different pricing scenarios, and we'll see those on the next slide. But just in general sense, um, your pricing choices within control, you can do pricing only, and that excludes any context whatsoever as far as capturing and calculating the cost of producing whatever um, item that is that you're gonna sell. So that's the pricing only piece. The flip of that is pricing with costing. So as you're going through the pricing then, control is calculating what the different parts are and how much each of those parts are being used and at what cost per unit of each of those. And then it's going to calculate the price. In, in one scenario, it's going to calculate the price based on the actual cost. But you can, there we'll see on the next slide, there's also pricing that is not directly related in, in res, as a result of the costing side. So pricing and costing. Uh, it gives you a great deal of a, a view, a better view of the profitability. Now, let's look at some of the options on pricing. As I mentioned, pricing uh, has, control supports many different versions of it. Probably the two most uh, dominant are the area-based pricing and the cost-based pricing. So kind of a terminology, area-based, it's also frequently referred to as square foot pricing. Cost-based pricing is often referred to simply as cost plus. So in, in area-based, you're gonna have a, a set up in control, the price per square foot of different things. So the control then is gonna take that price per square foot for whatever it is that you're gonna produce and apply that based on the quantity that may have uh, injected into it uh, setup charges, either one time or per piece or both. And it may, depending on how you are gonna set it up, 
it may include some allocation of, uh, of uh, to the price based on the uh, scrap charges. Some of the strengths of area-based pricing that it's relatively simple. And if you've come from a from an earlier system where you were using area-based pricing, that might provide a good means then of, of starting it with that in mind and then consider migrating to more cost-based uh, you know, in the future. Just like there are some strengths, there are also some weaknesses on area-based pricing. The accuracy on larger jobs becomes to get a little bit more foggy. There's no direct relationship to the cost. I found over the years that it's easy to forget uh, or ignore updating your pricing uh, as well as the cost so that you, you can, you can kind of get the impression at times that the pricing is a little bit more arbitrary than what it ought to be. Now, coming down to the cost-based pricing, every single part in control, whether that is equipment, labor, freight, material, miscellaneous, outsource, every single one of those have a cost, and they're going to have a markup, commonly referred to as a multiplier. The nice part, nice part about, or the strength that I think uh, exists with cost-based pricing, is that it's accurate. As long as your costs are accurate, then the price is going to be produced directly based on those costs, and it's much, much easier to uh, relate the cost to the price. The weakness, perhaps, is that it takes a little bit of effort to get the parts and the multiplier set up. And it might be a little bit tougher to, uh, you know, to be able to correlate how you are competitive wise with market pricing, with market conditions. So the bottom line is that the, to be effective and as, as good as it can be, cost-based pricing must have accurate costs and it must have up-to-date and, and relevant uh, multipliers in order to maintain the uh, uh, some degree of, of competitive, competitiveness. Now, I'm not going to go into any detail on some of the other methods. You can see those at the bottom of the screen. So area-based pricing, as I said, it takes the substrate charge, multiplies it by the number of feet, and that is part of the base price. If you're using scrap, it's going to control, we'll have calculated how much scrap is involved, and it's going to take a charge for that scrap, and that's going to be the scrap component. If there's any setup charges, they will be introduced, either one time or per piece charges. If there's any kind of increased percentage increase for uh, higher quality uh, images, for example, then that might be applied. So obviously then the pre-tax price is simply the sum of those four uh, components. On the, on the um, uh, cost-based pricing, it's gonna calculate the cost uh, in, uh, for the print side. If, it, if you're doing printing, it's gonna calculate the, the cost, including the lead in and lead out of any of your media. media. It's going to multiply that by a, a cost. And then for the price side, it's going to multiply it by the appropriate multiplier. And that becomes the sub, substrate price. Ink, similarly. Labor, similarly. So if you're using equipment, which you obviously would be, a lot of times the labor is, is related in some way to the uh, hourly uh, um, equipment cost either 100% or 50% or 75%, and then it's going to be up, applied by the, the labor rate and its uh, markup, and so on down the line. So the, again, the cost base, it's the sum of those four. Very, very simplistic uh, view on how the, um, how the, the these pricing uh, thing, options work. So 
pricing. Um, you must be, uh, you, you have to be competitive and it must be balanced with being profitable. That's the delicate balance. You gotta be, you wanna charge as much as your market will, can, will, will, will permit you to, call, to charge. Um, and hopefully that's gonna be uh, more than appropriate for, for being profitable. Parts, I'm gonna stress this again, parts must be accurate, the cost of them. Your hourly charge for the equipment, the hourly charge for the labor, and the per unit cost of the material. These need to be updated periodically. I advocate examining those at least on an annual basis, particularly, particularly the materials. I found when I was in uh, my business, there were sometimes that materials, uh, certain materials would uh, have a price change uh, midway through the year. Uh, so I, I tried to keep an eye on it and make sure, made sure that, that I updated my pricing or costing based on any severe fluctuations in, um, in costs. Part cost uh, multipliers, markups, that is your, that's your mechanism to address the competitive side. So if you see that you're a little bit on the high side for certain things, the resolution of that is to adjust downward the multiplier. And likewise, if you feel that margins aren't sufficient, then the solution would be to nudge some of the uh, um, uh, multipliers upward. So would a pricing evaluation be helpful? Those are the three questions that I, that I pose to people when I'm working with them if, if they're considering moving forward with an evaluation. Are your part costs out of date? Are the multipliers out of date? Just like I mentioned earlier, um, on a yearly basis, I would pose that question. Would a better way of determining and maintaining the multipliers be helpful? We'll look at the what I mean by that in detail as we go further today. And then do you have some gross margin concerns? If the answer to any <clears throat> of those three, um, hang on a second, just drop my earbud came out of my ear. Uh, if the answer to any of those three, then my suggestion is that a multi, that a uh, pricing evaluation would be of help. So what's the objective? The objective of doing it in an in-depth evaluation is to address gross margins and to simplify the part multiplier maintenance. The benefits, you're gonna get updated multipliers and that's gonna help achieve <clears throat> your gross margin targets that you're after. And then obviously, the results of the uh, engagement of a, a, finance, or a, a pricing evaluation, there's going to be <clears throat> an uh, implementation guide, and then the, re the analysis uh, results in, in, the, in form of reports will be provided to you. And we're going to look at those uh, uh, towards the end of the time, time today. So what's involved? What are the steps? The green step in step one, that is raw data out of control. All of the parts, equipment, labor, freight, material, miscellaneous, and um, outsource, all of those parts are exported out of control. And the biggest piece of it is exporting what control calls part usage data. And that can be quite extensive, depending on the, on your on your sales level. Um, and then thirdly, after that has been imported into the uh, into step two, then we will begin to discuss on an interactive basis gross margin targets. You'll see what they are now, and then we'll play some uh, games in. Uh, Decide where would you like that to be? 
So that's the step two piece. It's, it's going to be kind of a re, uh, iterative process in that step in that step two area. And then finally, when we get to the point where things look uh, look reasonable, then the reports will be provided to you. And there are six of them, six or seven of them. And we'll talk about, and I'll show you those uh, as we go through. Okay, now I want to switch gears, so bear with me. Um, before we get into the details of a, um, this is a handout that, um, um, and this handout is an extract of several different um, pieces of an engagement that I did for a client a, a few years ago. And when I say ex extracted, you'll see when we actually look at the detail one, it's considerably more extensive than what you're seeing here. This is a handout to kind of give you a flavor of what we're looking for anomalies. That's the objective when we do an engagement, we're looking for anomalies, okay? And some of the things that are highlighted in red uh, in this first piece here are anomalies. Because what it's saying is that there were two orders that had a cost of $3,382, but for some reason, the price was 250 so it produced a sizable negative gross margin. And this is simply looking at them in uh, most severe and coming down to uh, this middle group right here, uh, where it was basically was sold at cost. So these are anomalies in the sense that, hey, you better understand why the pricing was coming out negative in some of, in some of these examples. Now, if you look at the um, if you look at the magnitude, you know, he had roughly three hundred ninety thousand dollars in sales. So the sum of these that are negative are relatively small, but they're still not insignificant. And you should, by all means, understand why. Coming down here to this bottom one, that's a hundred percent. It says there's no cost associated with it. That probably is associated with the use of the miscellaneous product or perhaps the outsourced product, and you just simply didn't enter the cost. So that's going to give an artificial um, sense of a good gross margin. It's going to enhance artificially the gross margin because it's inconceivable that there would be no cost. Okay. So the anomalies are the negative gross margin on this first piece and also the, uh, the ones with no cost. The gray area here, what we're doing there and trying to illustrate is that this, all of the things that you sell, when I do a, a, an evaluate, pricing evaluation, are separated into three what I call buckets, fabricated goods things that you produce off of your digital printer or your cut vinyl or, or things of that nature, labor related services. That's going to be your design work. That's going to be your installation labor, the, your service labor. So things that are, that are service and labor driven. Okay. And then lastly, the miscellaneous and outsource. The reason these are separated is that, that it's, only makes sense that you can get a higher gross margin out of things that you fabricate. Labor related services typically have an even higher gross margin than that. And that's what you're seeing there. Miscellaneous and outsource stuff historically has a lower gross margin. It might be the dollar value might be high, but the gross margin is not going to be as um, as good as it should be. So what we're trying this is the green part here 
um, can't find my mouse, just a second, there it is. The green part here, this is the interactive part. We say, okay, this is what's happening now. This is where we would mutually agree that we want each of these to to go to you know to to go to, and that's going to get translated then into um, some adjustments to the multipliers. So down here at the bottom, it um, it shows what the current is using what I call actual price. What I mean by that is literal cost based pricing that's unrelated to anything about the customer. It's purely taking the cost of the, each of the parts, using the multiplier and saying that's the current price. The target price is what we're going to do to those multipliers to tweak the gross margin up to a target goal. So this particular uh, person was quite aggressive. He wanted to uh, uh, start from this level. This is where it is in reality. And he wanted it to go up to as high as 50%. And then on this handout, uh, you'll see there's some observations. And that, that's all it's intended to, to do, okay? This is a good spot to stop. Let's see if we have some questions. If not, then I'm going to go into uh, uh, an actual evaluation. Do we have any questions? The only question was whether this session was being recorded, which it yeah. is. Which it and, is, yes. And you should be getting the recording a few hours after the close of the webinar. Okay. I might just comment on this particular sheet that I'm looking at right now. This, the light blue, represents current default multiplier value is that was extracted from control. So for the equipment, it started off at two. These that are here are all, takes it down to the different categories. And this would represent a, a custom multiplier. But you, as you can see, there aren't any on this particular one. Down in the materials section, the default was four and a half. And you can see that very almost without exception, the um, multipliers for the different substrates vary all over the place. Very, very common. So the concept here is this is what is real today. And then based on what the, the we mutually agreed was our target, then it translates that and says, okay, the equipment needs to go from 2.0 to 2.3. The aluminum from 1.5, to a little over 1.5. So it gives you the before or the current, and then it takes you to the, uh, you know, the, the target. And that's what's gonna be implemented in, in control are these target, um, target multipliers. Now, I am going to switch my view one more time. Okay, don't panic. There is a lot of stuff here, lots and lots of numbers. It's not my intent to, you know, to, to scare or anything, but this is the complexity that I've been talking about. So over here, this is a, probably the most current one that I'm doing. Um, he has, he's, this particular gentleman, um, he's got 6, 23, uh, 30. He's made great, great in eliminating his negative gross margins. And he still has, you know, 30 or so. Um, very, very little involved with dollar, the dollar impact. 
He also made great strides in getting rid of um, items that he was not uh, being diligent in uh, in entering the cost. So he's done. You couldn't. You can't see the first one, but he he made great progress. Okay. So the gross margin was 45.7%. This is what's reflected in the uh, uh, in in the current. And this is the targets that we agreed to. Just a very subtle nudge in all of these. So the reality is that he is going to go from a gross margin of 45.7 to 47.0, just a little over a 1% growth, 1.3% growth in the uh, in the gross margin. And if you look at it from an effective uh, uh, markup, it went from a 1.84 to 1.89. Not significant, but yet it produced uh, an increase in the price from one point uh, from 1,642 average to 1,683. This is simply showing you the highest level view that control provides and that's at the part type so you have parts for equipment parts for freight for labor for overhead material other and outsource this simply shows the number of units that are involved the cost and then it distributes it based on the type and how that piece of equipment or or labor or material is being used okay so if you can see down here on the uh, on the outsource, he didn't have any. He's not used in the other. Uh, his cost was about a half a million dollars. And we looked at his internal reports, and the pricing of that was about three quarters of a million. So he was using effectively a 1.45 multiplier rather than the traditional 2.0. And that produces a 31% gross margin. And that's what you saw up here, okay? So we kind of looked at that as a side issue and then made the adjustment. This is the highest level view. Now it takes it one step deeper, okay? It takes it by type, but it also breaks it down by the different categories, okay, within within that area. So the cutters and the printers and the heat presses, he's not using laminators and stuff like that. Same thing's true with with the labor. All of the different labors that he's uh, that he's using. Now this one was kind of a red flag. Uh, I can't remember now exactly what the details were that we that we wanted to look at it and i can't, i just haven't changed it back your look overhead there really isn't any and the the uh, materials the one of the premises of the you, you doing an evaluation is for the most part there are exceptions but for the most part like material like all of the different acrylic parts probably would have you would want to have the same multiplier applied so that's the intent here so there's you can't see it i think we will on the next page um there might be just one part there might be 30 or 40 parts so the concept is that we're going to look at it and develop an average multiplier by category and that is a little bit of work the first time around but then it's going to become when uh, when we actually look at control at the end of our time today we'll we'll see how as you might continue to do this on a time on a, a periodically making adjustments in the multipliers becomes extremely easy and quick okay so this is at the category level. This 
is the view of his multipliers. Went from 2 to 205. Again, at the category level. Here's where you're seeing for the first time the, the service related uh, significance of, um, well, that one and these two are both service related. And that's the reason that you see the 1.7 of his labor parts with the exception of those that are service related where we pushed them a little bit higher, okay? Now pay attention to this column F and, and G as we get into the material. He has 72 acrylic parts and we want to condense those down. The average was 3.3 and we want to make that 3.5. So we're going to create what's called a user constant in control with the name like this, M acrylic. Then the first time that you do an engagement, you're going to go into each of the acrylic parts and you're going to enter the name of that user constant. So six months later, a year later, if you decide that you need to nudge that acrylic up or down, you simply change and edit the user constant. And then in this example, all 72 of those acrylic parts are going to get updated. So this is where the economy and the ease of maintenance you know, comes along. Moving on to the next one. I've hidden some of this because of um, um, client confidentiality, but the purpose of this, what this is saying that for each order listed here, there is at least one part in that order where either they did not capture the units involved or they ignored and didn't update the cost. So the check cost says that he didn't, that there was no cost. Units and cost says that both of them were ignored. So this is an FYI for you to go back and look at some of these orders and say, was it just a, a simple procedural thing that we just were negligent in not capturing the cost? And if it is negligence, kind of have a expectation of anybody that's doing the estimating or that they enter the cost, okay? So that's the purpose of this one. Similarly on this one, I've hidden the customer. But I, this one has in, de, in, in from poorest to largest gross margin, a list by invoice of which ones they are. And the objective is to go into each of those uh, orders and find out why. You know, what is it that, uh, you know, that, you, that the price ended up being below the cost? Is it procedural? Is it because you establish pricing for certain things based on a certain quantity? And then when you do an order, you keep the price that you agreed to, but it doesn't correlate with the cost at that point. And if that's the pattern, then you definitely need to consider using the control mechanism for calculating based on expectation, putting that into inventory where you can now at periodic reorders pull that out of inventory and it's going to have the appropriate price and it's going to have the appropriate cost. You're just doing it at one time, pushing it into inventory, then as it's being consumed, you're pulling it out of inventory. And that is quite likely what is contributing to some of these negative uh, negative gross margins, okay? And then it, it takes it on up, you know, to the high side as well. 
the last report is this one. I gotta take a sip of coffee just a second. This particular report, what we're after is finding out how many hours a day each of the pieces of equipment and labor are being used, okay? So this one is saying that for his, uh, for the hand cut labor part that you're all familiar with, just barely a third of an hour a day. Uh, these others are zero. They do, this client does a lot of installation work. So that consumes about seven and three quarters hours a day on down. So overall, he is he is consuming about 13 hours of labor in his shop, okay? On the equipment side, it's very similar. Taking it down to the individual part level. And this is the distribution of the hours. This is this is not guesswork. This is taking it straight out of every single order from control where the units, the number of units of, or in this case hours are, are expressed for every order. We're simply accumulating those in this in this particular report and then it, taking it down to the hourly level. <clears throat> the importance of this these numbers on the equipment side as well as the labor side is to help you in your in your hourly rate for equipment particularly that you're using actual hours history so that the the hourly rate can be based on that for that more precise consumption okay i see so 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 frequently when i'm helping people uh determine what their equipment hourly rate should be for maybe for a new business or if they buy a new piece of equipment that becomes a little bit more of a challenge they will always almost always overestimate how many hours a day that piece of equipment is going to be used if they overestimate it, they're going to underprice. They're going to undercharge for it. If they're too conservative, they're too conservative, and they put in a number that's too low, then the hourly rate is going to be artificially high. Because your cost of the equipment, that's that's easy to determine. What the challenge is is to use an accurate usage. If you're going to go back and try to reassess what your um what your equipment usage is per hour this guy was sh shocked with this uh, with just a half an hour uh, two tenths of an hour a day for his printers but when we looked at it realistically his particular strategy it relies a lot on outsourced goods so it may not be as out of line as what he initially thought that it would be. We're down to the last 15 minutes. I've covered what I want. I want to go back now into control. Can't find remote desktop in there. I'm going to minimize all of these. Okay. So to implement these changes, really quite easy. You'd go into setup, pricing setup, all pricing. Step number Paul, one. 
Paul, we're not yeah. seeing your screen. All right. That's better. You're seeing it now, right, Linda? I am. Okay, sorry. So anyway, I went in to set up, pricing set up. Then step number one is to come down to the default multipliers, default right here on the first column. And I would go in and edit these half a dozen based on that multiplier report uh, from the engagement. Just it's enter them six numbers. Second step, now once you've entered those for the default, then I encourage you to be patient and simply monitor for a day or two to make sure that you're not seeing any large bumps up or down that need to be discussed. Then, second step is to come in to the user constants. And I have created um, a user constant, and I've only got a small number of these in here. And within that, I have created three custom user constants for aluminum, the aluminum category, the banner digital category, and the laminate category. So the, these came from the multiplier report, the name and the value, okay? So now let's look at um, aluminum. I'm going to leave that page open. Go to part material flat aluminum. You can see I don't have many parts in this particular data set. But if I come out to the cost tab here, I'll edit that. This one is using the default, okay? If I wanted this part and others that are aluminum, I would change this to say M-A-L-U-M-I-N-U-M, -M, and that's all I would do, and then I would save it. So if you've got 10, 15, 20, you would the first time you would edit those parts and from now on when aluminum any of the aluminum parts are being used it's going to get the value from the user constant so it's a little bit time consuming the first time the second and the third and subsequent uh, engagements would be far quicker uh, to uh, to do Okay, to, to implement the changes. So I, am, I suggest starting with the default, let it set, you use it for a day or two, get the user constants in, but don't use them, don't make any associations to get them into the system. It's a second step, has no impact on any of the pricing. Then is the third step, begin kind of a slow, steady prog process of editing the various categories. And it, in reality, it's mostly going to be in the materials area and just take one or two categories at a time. Perhaps starting with the ones that are used the most frequently and represent the highest uh, bang for the bucks as far as making any adjustments. That's the process. Um, I'm going to stop. We've got uh, you know five or ten minutes to, for any and all questions. No questions. All right. On Thursday, we're going to have a somewhat similar pattern, um, but the topics will be. Um, financial analysis, um, 
very little of uh, any. In fact, there's nothing that is going to come from control. Uh, we will reference control at the very, very end because one of the objectives of the, of the financial analysis, of, among other things, is to determine what your labor cost should be. Um, and that's going to include the, the hours paid for production people. It's going to include taxes and benefits that are paid, and it's going to include an allocation for overhead. Those, the sum of those three becomes the labor rate. And then it may necessitate a slight adjustment in the multiplier, depending on the degree of uh, um, the degree of change from what your current labor rate would show to what the financial analysis um, indicates that uh, you know that it needs to be and that it needs to be is based on the premise that we're the financial analysis is going to go deep and say this is what your current net profit percentage is we'll play some what if games what do you what would you like it to become in the next year or so we'll inject that that target and then that's going to go backwards and it's going to tell us what the labor rate needs to be and what the what the new net profit will will be um i've covered everything thank you all very much for <clears throat> for joining i hope uh, i hope the session was uh, was helpful if you have any additional questions that you'd like to ask on a more private basis please either just give me a call uh, that's 515 360 9882, or send me an email. Um, the easiest one to remember is the serious one, which is the letter P, Kramy, K R A M M E, at serious.com. And my private one is Paul, at the letter P. K R A M M E consulting dot com. And I'd be glad to discuss it more privately uh any with uh, about any of this. Okay. Take care everybody. Thanks, Thanks again Paul. for joining us and hope to see you Thursday. Thank you. Yep, bye bye.